also need something to wipe this down with because there's it's kind of damp. Not my corpse husband, Beanie. Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back to my channel. <laughs> Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Cammie. What I like to do here on YouTube is I like to talk about true crime cases that either no other YouTubers have covered or not that many other YouTubers have covered. And that is exactly what we are going to be doing today. Today, we're gonna talk about a cult specifically about Father Divine. And y'all, there is, there is not that much information about this guy. And it's weird because this guy is pretty well known if you are familiar with one specific cult. But it's kind of weird because while there's not that much information about him, at the same time, there's like a whole lot of information about him. So it's it's kind of weird. So according to the rumor, Father Major Jealous Divine was actually born as George Baker in 1880. And it said that he was named after his father, but in other versions of the rumor, his father was named Joseph Baker. It's kind of mixed as to where it's accepted that he was born, but most people kind of agree that he was born in either Rockville, Maryland, or somewhere in Georgia. Anytime he'd get asked questions about his father, he would just kind of deflect and say that God God has no mother. I don't know what that has to do with his father. And there's almost like no information about his past. Like there's no information about what he was like as a kid, which is so bizarre to me. And we'll get into why that is in a minute. But the one thing that is confirmed about Father Divine is that sometime around 1912, he started traveling around and preaching in the South. And this is when he really started to carve out his preacher godlike personality that he became known for later in life. So he actually did try out other names besides Major Jealous Divine. Like he tried out the Messenger, Major J Divine, Major Jealous Divine. He really wanted a name that would make him sound holy. And he said the jealous in his name came from the jealousy that God felt. You know, they talk about how they serve a jealous God. That's really where he picked up the Father Major Jealous Divine, but eventually he settled on Father Divine. So one major aspect of Father Divine's worship were these like massive banquets that he and his wife had. And at this point they had around 30 followers. And look, when I first read about these like massive banquets where everyone would just like feast, I was like, ooh, that sounds great. But then like right away, I was like, no, Cammy, that's how you get involved in a cult. Father Divine and his wife held this employment agency out of their house and they would help the congregation find things like employment, housing, food, etc. And the congregation would show their appreciation to Father Divine by singing for him. So the early 1930s roll around and Father Divine's congregation had gotten so loud because remember they were singing to Father Divine that he had actually received a noise complaint and it actually led to Father Divine getting arrested and convicted. And and whenever he had gotten convicted, he, he had actually told the judge that he would be stricken down and die. And like two days later, the judge actually did die. Wild. Now this is something that the public really latched onto once it got out. And once his conviction was overturned, he just kind of blew up because of this. The media really publicized these claims that Father Divine was making. And that's because even though they didn't necessarily believe what Father Divine was saying. They knew that the controversy would sell super well. Things haven't really changed since then. Now this got back around to Father Divine and he just loved the attention. And because of this, he actually moved the church from its headquarters in Sayville to Harlem in 1933. Now I forgot to mention, his church was actually called the International Peace Movement. And okay, I keep calling it a church, but let's call it what it is. It's a cult. It's not a church at all. It's a cult. They believed that Father God was Father God. <sighs> That's the other cult. They believed that, you know, Father Divine was God. They believed in racial equality, gender segregation, marriage and celibacy to God. They also believed that heaven was a state of consciousness rather than an actual place. And they also said that children are assigned guardians that may or may not be their own parents. 
They didn't believe in smoking, drinking, receiving gifts, and they also believe use of the United States flag worldwide and use of English worldwide. They believed in communal ownership of property and if you owned any kind of goods, you had to donate it to the cult. So I mentioned that they believed in racial equality. Well, it wasn't quite racial equality. It was more like they just didn't believe race existed at all. They didn't believe anyone was so when they said they didn't see color they literally meant they didn't see color they didn't believe that anyone was black they didn't believe that anyone was white they believed in the complete rejection of race when they moved to new york it was actually in the middle of the harlem renaissance and it was during the migration of millions of black americans from the south to the northwest the midwest and the west so because of this father divine was actually able to capitalize it and caused his congregation to kind of grow a lot bigger, kind of explode. And this was especially true because at the time, so many black people were rejecting modern Christianity that had been passed on through slavery. They wanted Afrocentric forms of religion and turned to religions such as the International Peace Movement, the Nation of Islam, and the Moorish Science Temple, as well as the Ethiopian Hebrews. At the height of this cult size, it was in the tens of thousands thousands. It was a huge cult. And this is actually because it was in multiple countries. So when they lived at the compounds of the international peace movements, they paid 15 cents for one meal and they paid a dollar per night to live here. And they actually really liked this because it helped the people that lived here maintain a sort of sense of dignity. Now, a lot of these members actually abandoned their entire old lives and created new identities for themselves, including creating new names. So they would call themselves biblical names such as like Mary and Sarah or Peter Paul. And some would take on names that included like nature references, so like Flower Joy or something similar. The most devoted followers actually lived in movement-owned compounds that were referred to as heavens. Now, even though marriage was discouraged, Father Divine himself was actually married twice. A lot of the cult members actually walked out on their own family members because they said that Father Divine was a fraud and this pissed a lot of the women off. In addition to the criticism of the members who abandoned their old life to, fo to follow Father Divine, the cult generated no shortage of public scandals. Publications such as the New York Times would follow Father Divine very closely and they reported on everything that happened, such as the infighting and the numerous lawsuits, arrests and accusations circling the cult. Some of these allegations were child abuse, but those did end up being false, but there were also other charges such as racketeering. So 1937 was a hard year for the cult. So in April of 1937, there was actually a man that was stabbed with an ice pick for trying to deliver a summons on behalf of an ex-cult member. And this ex-cult member actually wanted money that she had given to the mission returned. The man was sent to the hospital with a near fatal stab wound to the stomach from this ice pick. That same day, another high-ranking member of the cult actually argued with Father Divine over money, and her name was Faithful Mary. She later defected, taking over a peace mission heaven in her name. Faithful Mary, whose legal name was Viola Wilson, later published an expose named God, He's Just a Natural Man, alleging that she and Father Divine had actually had a sexual relationship. She also claimed in this expose that his movement was just a scam to support his lavish lifestyle, which, yeah, that's, I mean, that's how I feel about most cults. Father Divine also got sued in May from a couple who had left the group over its gender separation policy. They sued him because he had refused to return money that they had given the mission whenever they had joined the cult. And they actually won this lawsuit, but they never received the money that he was ordered to give them. In 1942, Father Divine actually moved the headquarters of the international peace movement from Harlem to Philadelphia, and he cited this reason as to avoid legal, si legal situations. Even despite all of this, they still managed to keep recruiting members. An internal cooperative within the peace movement pooled finances to help build and operate dozens of hotels, laundromats, grocery stores, and restaurants, and all of them were called Heavens, which was another reference to the group's whole, oh, heaven is a place on earth rather than an actual 
place that you go after you die thing. The restaurants were open to the public and they featured meals for as little as 10 cents. And members encouraged the diners to indulge in these extravagant meals. Menus from the 60s included fried Louisiana gold shrimp and broiled tender lamets with mint jelly, both of which cost $2.50. Jumbo Australian lobster tail went for $3.25, a bowl of raspberries cost 20 cents, while 23 cents would buy a chef salad. So this was kind of a broad range of selections. You had raspberries, you had fried shrimp, you had lobster, and this was because they wanted to attract as many people as possible from the outside. That way he could try and attract them into his church. But at the same time, it also reflected the values of the people that were preparing them. The reason that they did this was because they wanted to really contrast the things like Nation of Islam, which the dietary practices in the Nation of Islam were about rejecting the food that was associated with slavery. Father Divine's theology really kind of put an emphasis on eating a lot and eating southern traditional food, like the fried southern traditional food, which is the exact opposite of what the Bible said to do. So even though these restaurants were staffed by some of the most devout followers that Father Divine had, they were operated just like any other restaurant that you would go to. You would go in, have your order taken, you would go sit down and be waited on, you would pay for your food and you would leave a tip. Most of these restaurants were licensed even though they did have some paperwork issues because they insisted on using their cult names. So I actually misspoke. So I said that you would tip, but there was actually a ban on tipping in these restaurants, which isn't common now, but it was even less common back then. But it makes sense if you look at the history of tipping because tipping started as a way to legally pay black employees less than the white employees. Father Divine knew this, and it's why he put a ban on tipping. And these restaurants were also integrated, which during Jim Crow era was incredibly unusual. I can't believe even a cult leader is like, tipping is banned. So even though Father Divine himself didn't believe in race as a concept, he knew that other people did not feel the same way. So he made a point to use his fame to talk about social issues. So he used these like massive banquets that he held as a way to talk about things such as lynching along with drafting petitions, as well as organizing marches in opposition to the practice. Now Father Divine was really big on advocating for civil rights. And he came about 20 years before Martin Luther King did. And as much as this guy was a cult leader, he was also a really big advocate for civil rights. And I will never deny that. There's actually a documentary called Father's Kingdom, and it actually compares Father Divine to people like Marcus Garvey and MLK. And the reason that he faded from history so much is that Father Divine never embraced the title of civil rights leader as well as his opposition to race as a whole. Despite the fact that the international peace movement never accepted gifts, Father Divine was a very luxurious man. He wore expensive suits, he drove in limousines, and that's something that's almost always noted in the media coverage of Father Divine is how just well-dressed he was and how he always showed up anywhere in limousines. <laughs> along, with, along with the peace movement social advocacy, <laughs> Father Divine, they also pushed for some weird ass policies like banning the word hello because it included the word hell in it. <laughs> I, they also pushed for requiring doctors to guarantee that they could cure health conditions or else be held responsible for the patient's death. I'm sorry, I can't get over banning hello. <laughs> I would be going to jail every single time I made a video. <laughs> so Father Divine's first wife was named Penaniah, and he married her on June 6th, 1882. And she was known as Mother Divine. So sadly in 1943, Penaniah passed away. When she passed away, Father Divine remarried to a 21 year old white blonde woman named Edna Rose Richings. <laughs> and she was actually his secretary. And this relationship was kept a secret until they got married. And it was only then that he told his followers that he had gotten married. So get this though. <laughs> 
Once they got married, he introduced her to his followers as his virgin bride and said that she was the reincarnation of Penania. So... <laughs> it's weird, but... So because of the fact that Father Divine's teachings directly contradicted his actions, a lot of his followers didn't really take him seriously. Like, at all. Even so, his followers continued to be loyal to him throughout the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, attending his banquets, spreading the mission's beliefs, all that kind of stuff. However, in 1965, Father Divine died and most of the movement kind of died with him. Still, even despite this, many followers chose to follow Mother Divine and they kind of believe that his presence never really left. As membership dropped, most other properties were sold and the Keyflower Dining Room, which was the last movement owned restaurant in Philadelphia, was closed in 2006. They still have their headquarters though, and it's in the Woodmont Mansion, which is a historic landmark in suburban Philadelphia where roughly 20 members still live. So there's still 20 members of this cult. There's also the Circle Mission in the Philly proper and a location in Sayville. The Woodmont campus is also home to public tours and it's a museum and they have a library to preserve Father Divine's memory. They also still have these big banquets every single Sunday. The small remaining devotees set a table at the Woodmont estate so that way they can have their banquets. They set places for themselves Father Divine and Mother Divine, and they serve Father Divine first, even though he died like 53 years ago. They sing to him, pray to him, and speak to him as if he's still there. And that's because they believe that he is still there. Mother Divine actually attended meals until her death in 2017. But even now, the most faithful, most of which who are in their 80s and 90s, still proceed to you know, serve her. They set her place just like they do for Father Divine and they speak to her, sing to her, pray to her just like if she's still there. In 2017, 200 guests gathered to celebrate the grand opening of the Father Divine Library Museum at Woodmont. Now, something important to note is that Father Divine and the International Peace Movement served to create another very well-known cult. The late 1950s is when the cult really started to decline and a certain cult leader learned of Father Divine and his teachings from reading about world religions and he thought, maybe if I take some of these teachings and apply them to my own practices, the people's temple will grow. Yes, that is right, my beautiful friends. Father Divine helped serve in the creation of the people's temple and Jim Jones and Jonestown. Anyone that really looks extensively into Jim Jones already knows who Father Divine is, but it's very rare that I actually hear anyone mention Father Divine. I think the only one that I've heard mention him or even like talk about him briefly is Stephanie Harlow. It's alleged that among Jim Jones's things at Jonestown was a copy of Sarah Harris's 1953 book, Father Divine, Holy Husband, in which she suggested that the mass suicides of Father Divine's followers might follow upon his death because of the fact that Penaniah's death had already caused a stir among his followers, which I don't know if I mentioned, but Penaniah's death was actually kept a secret until <laughs> until Father Divine announced that he was remarried. So he just, you know, I guess people were asking, where's Mother Divine? And he's like, so oh, she's in there doing something. <laughs> don't question it. <laughs> I don't know how you'd keep that a secret considering they prayed to them daily, but when he announced that Penaniah had died, he said that her spirit had decided to reincarnate into the body of Sweet Angel, AKA Edna. That's what he was calling her, by the way, was Sweet Angel. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> that gives me the heebie-jeebies. I hate that so much. So Jim's first trip to the peace mission actually was in the late 1950s and it start it started as f this fucking sentence man freaking Jim Jones man so Jim's first trip to the so Jim's first trip to the peace mission was actually in the 1950s and it began as a fact-finding mission 
Jim had originally hated the idea of followers worshiping a man and calling him father. And at the time, he had even forbidden his own followers from calling him even reverend. But as soon as he saw how loyal his, that Father Divine's followers were to him, it was like a switch was flipped and suddenly that's what Jim wanted. Jim's change of heart was also due to the mission's success at finding a racially integrated congregation. He called the mission, quote, a flower garden of integration, which was exemplary of the cooperative communalism he wished to emulate with People's Temple. So when Jim met Father Divine, he laid it on thick. He got deep into conversation with him about uh, desegregation and overpopulation and Divine just absolutely loved Jim. He even wanted Jim to do a sermon at his church but Jim was plotting. There were gears turning in Jim's head. He went back to Indiana and just was plotting to be even bigger than Father Divine. Father Divine never really left the town that they were living in and because the movement was already dying out Jim thought that that would make it easier for him to steal away the members of Father Divine's congregation and get them to follow him instead. So he goes back to his congregation and starts telling his followers that he's going to integrate the churches. And this was really when Jim told his followers to start calling him dad. They also, he also told his followers to call Marcy mom and call each other brother and sister. This was also whenever he was telling his followers to start giving everything they had to the people's temple. Here's the thing though. Father Divine didn't really seem horrifying. Oh man, that's how they would get me to join a cult. <laughs> so in 1959, Jim went back to Father Divine's congregation and he was like, okay, I'm here. I'm ready to take over your congregation when you die. And Father Divine was like, dude, what the hell? Father Divine just didn't take him seriously like at all. There was also like this big thing where Jim tried to take over the congregation by force when Father Divine finally did die. And the followers were just not having it. They, they were pissed that Jim was trying to steal them away from Father Divine. Jim went to like extreme lengths over that. It, they, he was even like trying to like kidnap some of the members, but that would be for a completely different video. So that is everything about Father Divine and the international peace movement. Yeah, it was a little bit weird, a little bit wacky, but I figured, you know, it was light enough where there was no murder. I figured we could take a break from the murder. We could take a break from the assault and kidnapping and all that this week and have something a little bit lighthearted. <laughs> I don't know if you could consider a cult lighthearted, but thankfully there was no murder in this one. So that's what I got for y'all this week. So let me know what y'all think of this one. Do y'all think that Father Divine was a better cult? No, don't let me know that. Father Divine was not a better cult leader. <laughs> he was still a cult leader. It was still bad. Don't join a cult just because the leader seems better, y'all. <laughs> but seriously, I do want to know what y'all think about this one in the comments below. And I will see you all in my next one. Bye.